So hi, Sean. This is hi. Queen. Hi, uh, Queen. How are you? Good, good. So I'm based in London as well. I am. So I'm taking care of the BOF, uh, the China section. So we have a Chinese edition. And I'm the editorial director and the reporting from London, and we have a team based in China. So it's my honor to speak with you today. So shall oh. we start? Yeah, mine too. Lovely to meet you. And I'm, oh, I'm glad that you're here in London. How fascinating. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's such a shame that we couldn't be doing this in person. Exactly. But, exactly. But you know what? It's great. It's lovely to meet you. So I look forward to our time together. Great. So um, my first question is like this year is a very special year for you because the year that brands reached the 21st, uh, 21 years and you personally are 50 years old, which is a very significant meaning in China. So what does this mean to you and what does this mean to your brand? Well, I suppose when I hit 50 and... Um, the brand is celebrating 21 years also. It was a very poignant time. And I really wanted to reflect back on my career and to date, and, but, not, but not, only, not only just reflect on my career, but I wanted, to, I wanted to bring together all those wonderful images throughout my career that defined my career. I wanted to showcase the collaborations that molded my practice and kind of helped mold me to be the designer and the craftsman that I am today. And I suppose what really took me to that point about creating a book, which was to celebrate my 50 years birthday and my 21 years of the brand, was accumulation of many things, that very important part in my time in my life. Um, but also, for many years, I have been very flattered that students have constantly written to me and inquired about images to use for their dissertations or for their studies about my work in jewellery and my work in fashion and how I fuse the two. And if, as you can imagine, my shared docs in our, on, on our system is full of amazing imagery. I have a library, a visual library that goes back, gosh, 30 years, amazing images from Nick Knight to Sean Ellis to Chris Moore, you know, international world acclaimed photographers and images of my work and the collaborations. And I've spent many years sharing that with students and sharing that with people that are inspired by my work. So for me to celebrate this, milestone in my life and my career I thought it would be beautiful to bring all of those images into one place into a book so that new budding blossoming students whether they be jewelry or fashion could hopefully be inspired and provoked as well by the images that are in the book and I think for me as well it's it was a really important time as well because not only was it I was 50 years old and 21 years for the brand, but it was 10 years, it was the 10 year anniversary of the passing of my dear, dear friend, Lee Alexander McQueen. And in a way, I also wanted to celebrate him mm -hmm. and I wanted to celebrate the beautiful friendship we had. And not only that, but how rare what we had was we had this beautiful friendship for 22 years, but we were also artistic collaborators and what we created. So in a way, the book was a reflection on my past, my career, the inspiration, how I provoked, but also a celebration of the beautiful friendship that I had with McQueen and our artistic journey. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, when we when we're trying to introduce you and the Shaolin brand to the Chinese world of fashion, we have to mention Alexander McQueen, who is really, really important to you. So could you share with us your story with him and how did you work together? And you know, um, like how you inspired and motivated and even provoked each other because I really like the word you're saying provocative because every time in fashion industry we're talking about inspiring but I like, 
I like the word provocative. So how do you see McQueen's role play in your life and vice versa? Um, well, I always think about, I always think the moment we met was such a beautiful moment of serendipity. Because if you can imagine when me and Lee McQueen, he's known to his friends as Lee, um, when me and Lee met, we were both 22 years old and he was studying at Central St. Martin's doing his MA in fashion. And mm -hmm. I had just finished a seven year goldsmithing apprenticeship in Hatton Garden, mm -hmm. of which I started when I was 15. And our worlds were worlds apart. He was a very avant-garde fashion student. I was a very high refined, goldsmith working for the most prestigious Bond Street stores in London, creating jewels for royal families all over the world. My world, my work was very classic. It was very traditional. It was very high end. It was diamonds, sapphires, emeralds. So our worlds were quite different. I came from that classical background, that training, and he was this avant-garde fashion designer. But we became the closest of friends because we were very similar. We were 22 years old. We were both from London. We had the same energy. We were living in a vibrant time. This was the early 90s. And he, kind, he changed my perception of my discipline. He asked if I would work with him on his shows um, in 1994. And at that time, I was very conditioned goldsmith and I worked in diamonds and made tiaras. You know, by that age, I was making diamond tiaras for Aspreys. And when he asked me to work with him on his shows and create jewellery, if you can imagine, I was very conditioned. Diamonds and gold were my world. And I, I said to Lee, I don't understand. How are we going to make jewellery for your shows, you know? you've just finished college and I've just finished my apprenticeship. We don't have the funds to create large diamond jewelry pieces. But it was then he turned around to me and said, well, sure, no, I've seen what you can make and I've seen your skill. He said, if you just apply that skill to any medium, mm -hmm. you can create anything, any shape, any form. And it was that moment that he made me realize I had a skill and it was my hands. And with that, and a fearless approach to design and innovation and evolving, I could create anything. And it was from there we both, I said to him, yeah, let's do this, it will be fun. And from there I started working with him on the fashion shows. But where I by day would be making diamond chandelier earrings, for him I was making jewelry that was more about an emotion, a persona, I was provoking, where jewellery should be worn, how jewellery should be worn, what materials should jewellery be made from. So if you can imagine, I'd gone from this very classical trained goldsmith to this really avant-garde jeweller. And what, what Lee gave me was a really beautiful platform. It was a real freedom of expression and creativity. And the platform he gave me was his runways and his concepts. And there were no constraints. There were no commercial constraints. And what I loved about working with Lee was we would together explore how jewellery could be worn. Why does it have to be an earring that hangs down? Why can't it be an earring that surrounds the whole ear? And I think if, you, if we look at Lee's work, he was about exploring the body and form and changing the silhouettes of fashion. Mm -hmm. And anybody that worked with him, he encouraged them to do that in their discipline, in their medium. So working alongside him was so encouraging because I would question, you know, the 700 year industry that I was part of. Why does jewelry have to be worn a certain way? Why does it have to be made of gold and diamonds only? Why does it represent wealth? Can it not represent someone's persona, their energy? Can it not empower them in a different way? And I think that's what I took from working with Lee. And, um, and every single show was exciting and driven by challenge and adrenaline. And every show we would create the new and bigger and we would explore scale. 
For example, in the very first shows, I made silver pieces like the crown of thorns or the very large, long tusk earring. I made kind of headdresses and more bracelets and necklaces. But the very first time I made a body sculptured piece like the skeleton corset, mm. you know, Lee was brilliant at not challenging you, but encouraging you to challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. so it really pushed me to explore what I could achieve as a craftsman and from that going from head accessories and bracelets and necklaces I then started forming body sculpture mm -hmm. and the minute I did that Lee knew that the boundaries were endless mm -hmm. what I could achieve with him was endless and we could explore jewelry not in just a form as an accessory to wear with the fashion, it could become the fashion. Mm -hmm. So if you remember the garments, some of them were half metal and half fabric. So there was this question, was the garment the jewel or was the jewel the garment? Mm -hmm. And I think we together love to push that boundary and ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Basically, you two uh, were together and challenging all the limitation on this definition about traditional fashion and jewelry. Yeah, exactly. And I think because we both came from a world of tradition, mm -hmm. you know, Lee's training was Savile Row. He had a very strict, beautiful foundation craft training, mm -hmm. as did I, because my training was Hatton Garden and I was taught by two great masters mm -hmm. um, from the jewelry industry. So we both had this foundation, this very solid traditional training. But yet we had this London energy where we wanted to push the boundaries and take and respect our heritage and respect our craft, but yeah. use it as a tool to create the new, to create fashion and jewellery that was current, that was the 21st century, but still <laughs> executed to the finest and highest of standards. Mm -hmm. Sure. So as a jewelry designer, what do you think is the most beautiful part of making jewelry pieces and what makes it different from the other fashion sector? And ah. the question will be what are the biggest challenges for you? I think one of the most beautiful things for me about making jewelry is that jewelry holds a memory. Mm -hmm. an emotion a time and due to the longevity of jewelry due to the materials that it's made from from metals whether they be precious or not and the longevity of gemstones their their ageless time and their tenacity jewelry lasts for hundreds and hundreds of years mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing about jewelry that I love about jewelry that I'm so romantically attached to is that jewelry can hold those emotions. It can hold those sentiments and memories. And when one plays with a piece of a jewel that they wear or they've been given by their mother for their 21st birthday or that when there was a child, the first bangle that they got, when you play with that or wear it, you relive those emotions and those memories. And I think that is the beautiful thing about making jewellery because I know that I'm making something that will mean something to somebody. It will mean a moment in their life and a memory. And not only is it in their life, the beautiful thing about jewellery is you can pass it on. Yeah. You can pass it on to your, your children or your grandchildren. And it's a heritage. It's a story that runs through a family line. And I think that is, I think, one of the beautiful things I think personally the, we, we are connected with jewellery. Another thing that I think is quite beautiful about jewellery is that it is such a beautiful, because of due to its longevity in its materials, it's such a record of history. You know, mm. I love fashion, I love garments, I love fabric, I, and I love fashion. But the, the, the fragility of fabrics do not withstand the time Mm. of the of the substance of metal and gemstones so if we look back at jewelry like art deco jewelry victorian jewelry georgian jewelry there is such a breath of amazing history in jewelry that is still with us today even mm. if we look back at the egyptians of tutankhamun those amazing pieces of jewelry they are records in history that we still have today 
-hmm. And I think for me, that is one of the beautiful things about jewelry. It has all those connotations, history, mm -hmm. it's a record and emotions. Basically the literary saying timelessness. Yeah, it, it's just timeless and the longevity of jewelry. Mm. And what about the biggest challenges? The biggest challenges of making jewelry, I think for me, because I am a designer and a craftsman that likes to explore new silhouettes and new areas of the body to where and how a piece of jewelry can be worn to reflect the innovation and the daringness and fearlessness of the person who's going to wear it. For me, the most challenging thing is to create jewelry that is elegant, mm -hmm. refined, empowering, mm -hmm. and becomes part of a person. It complements the person, not overpowering the person. Because if you think about jewelry, it is a chain around the neck. It is metal around the wrist. It's, it's a piece of metal that hangs from the ear. It has to be made so beautifully and so well that it blends in with the person. It doesn't overpower the person. So for me, when I'm making a piece of jewelry, I try that piece of jewelry on constantly. I am wearing it, I'm feeling it, I'm moving with it. I want to know that it complements and becomes part of that person instead of looking clumsy or awkward. Or I think jewelry for me is not about an accessory it's about in adorning and enhancing the form of a man or a woman um, so when we talk about fashion des uh, jewelry designers they are all uh, normally restricted by its materials and in any forms expressions and wearabilities but you are totally different so what's your secret sauce for you know crossing all the boundaries between fashion jewelry body performance design and arts and what's your design philosophy involving these years i suppose working with mcqueen he always taught me that fashion and jewelry is to work with the body and to work with each other. And when I create a jewel, I don't think, the first thing I think about is how that jewel works with a person, how it looks, how it follows the contours of their body, how they will feel wearing that piece, how it will empower them. And I think more about, I'm very different to other jewelry designers as some jewelry designers or how we were taught, even how I was taught in my very early days was to celebrate the stone or a gemstone, mm -hmm. to, to get a stone and design around it. Mm -hmm. And I'm very different. I actually think of an object first. Mm -hmm. I think of an object. I think about how that piece is going to work on the human form, on the body. How's it going to make that person feel? How are they going to move in it? How is it going to make them feel? Is it sexy? Is it empowering? Is it confident? So I create an object first. So like an objet d'art. Mm -hmm. And then... I choose the stones, mm -hmm. then I choose the textures and the enamels. It's more, it's more about, for me, I create a silhouette, an emotion, mm -hmm. then I use the beauty of the natural world, whether it be feathers, gemstones, or gold or silver, then to decorate the piece. Mm -hmm. So I really start from a different place. And for me, the place is the emotion. It's the person. So when I start there, there is no limits to my work because I'm not restricted by it has to be a necklace. It has to be a bracelet. It has to be an earring. It, I don't restrict myself. And I think also there is another point which, you know, when I first started my business 21 years ago, I was in the throes of working with McQueen on his shows and in Givenchy. And I was in the middle of working at Haute Couture with him at Givenchy. And my world was jewelry, but it was very much fashion. Mm -hmm. And 
when I set my house up, unlike a lot of other jewelry houses, I set my house up with a with a view of being a couture house. Mm-hmm. So like fashion and couture, I created couture jewelry, which to me was fantasy and the magic, and it was unique. Mm-hmm. And then from that, I took elements and then I could create different silhouettes, different places to be worn, and earrings, and kind of take elements of that fantasy to create more, as one would say, more commercial pieces. Mm-hmm. And you are also very successful commercially, um, but now the jewelry world is like dominated by a lot of mega brands, big houses. How did you make this success and how do you balance your commercial part and your creativity? I think that's a great question. And it's, you see, being a brand, I kind of more like to see myself as a a house, like Mm. an artisan. Mm. And we have organically formed into a brand, but I still have the attitude and the ethos of, we are artisans here in the house of Sean Lee, and we are a house and we are a jewelers, but we are avant-garde, we are fearless and daring. When I first worked with McQueen and then we worked with Givenchy and we worked in Couture, I embraced that magic of Couture, that essence of freedom of creativity. And I still apply that to everything I do now. Mm -hmm. So if I'm designing a collection, I will not be restricted by commerciality. I will not be restricted by somebody saying to me, we have to make an earring that is this price or that price. I I don't start there. I start up here in the magic Mm -hmm. and I design the most wonderful avant-garde piece like I would for McQueen, like a catwalk piece. I will design the fantasy and from that, Mm -hmm. then I will take elements Mm -hmm. and I will take pieces that can become more accessible to be worn away from the catwalk Mm -hmm. and I think what's beautiful about that and how that has been quite consistent in my work and I've retained my integrity is because when I design up here and I think of the magic and the fantasy and I take elements of that and bring it into more accessible pieces the energy is the same Mm -hmm. so when somebody buys a smaller piece from me they still retain the same energy as the big piece. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it is the Mm -hmm. romance of having a creative freedom. And I'm I'm quite romantic and I'm very imaginative and I have a wild imagination and I always have. And I think I like to be free with that. And then from that comes elements, many facets within the house that all retain that energy. So your jewelry not only attracts many celebrities and royalties like Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, uh, Cara Delevingne, like Kate Winslet, but also it's very easy accessible to mass audience as well. So why do you think your jewelry has a power across in such wide range of people? And how do you balance your bespoke business and with mass production? I think fundamentally the reason why my work is it reaches such a wide audience is because my work isn't about trends or a particular style. I design on a basis of emotion. Mm. And I like to design jewelry. And when I design jewelry and when I'm crafting the jewelry myself, I will hold an earring up to my ear. I will wear that earring to see how it feels, how it moves. And when I am, I feel the emotion, especially some of the more confident pieces that I create. I'll put a hook earring in, for example, and it will make me sit up. It will give me a posture. It will empower me. And I connect with the work. That's what I like to do. And 
I feel that my work is is not about a style or a trend because then I isolate myself to smaller pockets of groups. It's more about the, it's a more of a connection of how I want to make someone feel empowered mm -hmm. and confident and beautiful. So that's why I feel that my work has such a wide range from celebrities to royals to young to the old it's not a trend it's not a style it's well it is a style but it's more about the emotion and how it makes you feel and I think that's why I think that's why I've been successful with the ethos of my work and it was never really planned that way it was never I didn't think about 20 you know 25 years ago I didn't think right I'm going to create jewelry that is this and that and empowering it was natural. It was organic to me, as it was for Lee McQueen. You know, we came from a world where we wanted to empower. We wanted to create jewellery and fashion that was for the woman of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. You know, in the good old days, like everyone is so excited to see uh, new talents or new creations. But now with the tech changes and uh, social media has come in like basically everyone sees everything now so what kind of jewelry like people are looking for in this era i think or what i would well, not well what i'm experiencing to be honest with my collectors mm -hmm. and everybody that i deal with and work with is i feel people are looking for jewelry that has sentiment Mm -hmm. it it is powerful in in a form of memory in a form of sentiment a special time even superstition and hope mm. you know everything that i'm creating at the moment has a lot of symbolism mm. a lot of people that are my collectors even my bespoke clients they want the pieces to be as normal and beautiful, refined, elegantly made, empowering and beautiful. But they want these sentiments added to the piece. And, and I'm suggesting that as well, because I think in, in a very uncertain times and in quite strange times, I think people connect to their jewellery. They wear it. They play with it. It becomes part of them. So having an emotion attached to that and an element of hope mm is what I think people are, are really looking for or, or craving for as well. So for me, I'm, I'm seeing that definitely amongst my collectors. So, um, you know, in the fashion world now these days, uh, everybody talks about street style or like hives. So are there any similar trends or hives in the jewelry sector? And does this take over the timeless style? Um, for me, there is. I think fashion and jewellery are very much in line a lot more today in recent years. But if we go back, if we think about it, fashion and jewellery have walked hand in hand for centuries. Mm -hmm. You know, with fashion and jewellery, if we look at the Art Deco period, the Art Deco fashions were really strong. Art Deco jewelry in that period was really strong and it was very connected, as was the Victorian times and the Georgian. Mm -hmm. And I think fashion and jewelry have always walked hand in hand. There was a period, I think, where there was a disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now we are seeing trends of fashion and jewelry lining up a little bit more. Um, we are seeing brands emerge that are more seasonal and more fast and creating jewellery that is very much in line with the, the speed of the fashion industry. And we always had that because we always had a thriving and always have and always still have an amazing costume jewellery sector of the industry. Mm. And I see it moving into fine jewellery now with some of the big houses like Louis Vuitton and some of the big other houses creating fine high-end jewellery lines now yeah. and it's beautiful for me to see um I don't think it takes away from the timelessness of jewellery because there are so many 
jewelers and styles and houses that accommodate many different collectors and clients mm -hmm. and like in fashion we have very the avant-garde in fashion we have couture and then we have the brands that are timeless and classic and that have been around for centuries and I think that's reflected as well in jewelry mm -hmm. um it's for me it's good to see the 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 connection between jewelry and fashion goes side and side again because that's very much what me and McQueen were trying to demonstrate way back in the 90s the importance of how these two great disciplines can come to together to create a look not to accessorize each other but to be as one mm. yeah and now you know because of the pandemic has the COVID-19 impact your business at all because many jewelry brands says you know it's successfully online jewelry brands find it's very hard to go offline. But a very successful offline jewelry brands find it's very hard to sell online. But you, I think your brand is exceptional. So could you please share with us your secret of balancing online and offline marketing and sales? Um, I think we have done particularly well in a way that it's. Uh, it's it's due to the the loyalty and the understanding and the appreciation of my design and my craft from our collectors. Our collectors are worldwide. We sell our jewelry all over the world, and online is a really beautiful platform for us to be able to do that. And I use it more as a platform to reach and to be there and accessible for our collectors all over the world. And I think here in the house, we have a very personal approach and attitude where we have a really beautiful service. We're not just an online platform, we're here, we talk to our collectors. So it's really like online, offline, we are online, but it's a real beautiful artisan service as well that we provide. Um, and working offline, I think for me, it goes back to what I was saying about a couture house. Mm. I have a beautiful house here in Bond Street where we have a three floor muse, we have a boutique, we have are, are, are the heart of the company, which is all the working areas, the, the office area. But then on the top of the building, we have my atelier, mm. where everything is made. So we have this beautiful house. And I think what I love about it is that people can come here and we have the bespoke service and we still have the boutique and people can experience the Sean Lean house. But we want to share that with the world. So online is a really beautiful way of doing it. And I think we do it with that ethos that we're, we're sharing the house with the world instead of it's just an online platform. So it's more about having a larger shop window, as one would say. Has the COVID-19 impact your method to doing business? Um, it has and it hasn't because... Before COVID, I, it's, it's how COVID has affected our business, it has affected the business on, we have many facets to the business. We have bespoke, we have the online, we have retail and we have wholesale. We have stores all over the world mm. and um, wholesale accounts. Obviously the retail world, the retail side of our business got affected because of um, COVID, stores were closed. But the other elements of the business thrived mm. because before COVID, I always had this service for bespoke where my clients are all over the world and they can't always come to London and I can't always go to them. So I always had this beautiful service is where I would Skype with a collector. I would design for them. I would email them designs. And then we have, I very much embrace modern technology. So we have 3D printers here. So we would design the ring on CAD and build the ring in resin. Then I would ship that to them wherever they were in China, America. And the client has the design through technology. 
uh, you know, we design here, we email it, then we can send a resin ring or the necklace so they can see the proportion and the size and they can try it on and wear it for a while. Mm -hmm. And then once they've got used to the piece, then we will then start to make it here in London. Mm -hmm. So, but that side of our business really increased because I think people still wanted to embrace and celebrate my work. They wanted the emotion that my work gave, which is always quite empowering and sentimental. And they loved the fact that I would Skype and I would still go through the design process with them. I would draw and then email them the drawing. And I think technology is amazing. It's opened up the world. It's made the world a smaller place and made things more accessible. But initially the craft and the execution is done here in London, but technology has allowed us to mm -hmm. offer it to the world. Mm -hmm. So Lee McQueen once said to demolish the rules, but to keep the tradition. So which one is more important to you, breaking rules or keeping tradition? They both are important. <laughs> They're very much like my dear friend Lee. They are both very much um, part of me too. Mm. I have a dear, I have a great respect for my heritage, for the craft that I have been taught. Mm. I did a seven year apprenticeship in fine goldsmithing in Hatton Garden. And that knowledge I was passed down for seven years was hundreds and hundreds of years of knowledge being passed down from master to master to master to me. And mm -hmm. I have to pass that on too with my apprenticeship scheme. Mm -hmm. And I have a great respect for heritage and craft. But if we look at the past masters mm -hmm. in the Victorian times or even the Art Deco times particularly, how bold those mm -hmm. jewelers were in that period, they took very ornate, detailed Victorian Georgian jewelry, but they made very linear, sharp, strong line and bold, big statement pieces. They were they evolved. Mm -hmm. We have to evolve in every discipline, whether it be fashion or jewelry, we all have to evolve. Mm -hmm. And for me, one should always respect tradition and heritage because that is the classic training. That is fundamentally the execution the beauty of making something properly. But with design and approach, I mm. feel that we should all, what well, I speak for myself, should evolve, reinvent, push the boundaries, be fearless, be daring, mm. create the new, create jewelry that is for the 21st century. Mm. And for me, tradition is very important and heritage, but breaking the rules mm -hmm. is just as much as important because mm -hmm. without breaking the rules, we do not achieve the new. Mm. So how do you see yourself and your brand uh, in 10 years time? So that is a great question. And in this very crazy world, to think in 10 years time <laughs> is really difficult to do right I'm now. To everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, how I would like to see my brand in 10 years time is still to retain the integrity and the energy that I have retained with it over the last 21, 30 years. I have grown the house of Shaolin very organically and I've moved with the times and the decades and I've always kept my ethos and my energy of what the work is about. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to retain that. In 10 years' time, I still want the jewels I create. We would have grown. Our audience will be larger, of course. That's organic. And that's, that's how it, well, God willing, but that's how it works. And, you know, we'll have a larger audience. But however large that audience is, I still want the work to have its integrity. I still want it to empower people. I still want it to be refined and beautifully made. And I think being the artisan house that we are, mm. I want it to retain that mm. so that when people come to the house or they buy online, they are buying a part of 
me and they're mm-hmm. buying a part of London mm-hmm. and my history and the energy that I created with McQueen and the energy that I still create within myself. Mm-hmm. And because I think that's what people yearn for. They yearn for an identification. They yearn to connect with a, with a house or a brand. They need to feel the energy and particularly in these times and the way the world may change and the way where we may go. I think it's really important that a house creates pieces and work for collectors and people that can connect and feel empowered and a connection or more importantly, feel an emotional connection so that they, so they treasure the piece and it becomes part of them. Mm. So from my point of view, I think two things are for sure. Uh, one is your visual library is going getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> yes, of course, it, it is. <laughs> and also your legacy and your camaraderate uh, with Lee will be passed on this thing, inspiring people and empowers people. I hope so. I do hope so, because I think what, what, what myself and Lee did in the 90s and the, and, the, and the thousands is we really pushed the boundaries and we really showed, we provoked and we questioned. And I hope that we showed a way that creativity has no limits. Mm. And if one appreciates one's skill and understands when armed with a skill, and the fearlessness to question tradition, mm. but armed with a dis- you know, armed with a skill, the sky is the limit, exactly. and you can you can create anything. Okay. As as was the exact words of what Lee told oh. me many many years ago. I don't know if you know this, but my generation and I ask a lot of my peers why we get into this industry and why like more wider people getting interested with fashion because of your work. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. What a lovely compliment. Surprise at that time, like can fashion and jewelry be such beautiful creations, but you know, very off the limits, like everything is so special. Ah, oh, thank you so much. That's so lovely to hear. Thank you. And well, that's the reason I created my book because I wanted to put it all into one place so that I hopefully one day my book would become a part of a very blossoming new jewelry designer or fashion designer. And it was there part of their library to invoke and provoke and inspire them to create the new. Mm -hmm. So our last question will be just imagine if you were not a jewelry designer and what could you do? What would you be doing? Well, that is a brilliant question because it really sums up why I am in jewellery and how I got into jewellery. When I, so I would have loved to have been an archaeologist. Mm. So when I was a very young boy, my parents, um, live, they still live in the same house, actually. It's a beautiful Victorian house mm-hmm. and with a very big Victorian garden. and. When I was very young, I spent most of the time digging up their garden, Mm. looking for old artifacts. And I would find in the garden old Victorian glass bottles and many things. And I was fascinated by objects and finding things and digging up history. Mm. And I think then at a very young age, I had this attachment with the history and the, the mystique of objects and what stories they could tell. Mm-hmm. So I think when I first started making jewelry, the romance was reborn because I thought the pieces that I'm making, due to the longevity, the materials that they're made from, they will be around for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. So just like those little Victorian bottles that I used to find in my mother's garden, I hope that one day the pieces that I create will be one day artifacts that are Mm. a record of our history, really. So, Mm. but if I wasn't going to be a jeweler, I would definitely be an an archaeologist for sure. Lovely. Thank you for your time. It was really great to talk with you. Thank you.